Hello, good morning. Welcome to church. How you doing? Good to see you. You feeling good? Did you have a good week? I want to say hi to everybody who's watching online. Hope you're doing well. Why don't you go ahead and turn to somebody next to you and say, it's been a good morning. That's good. That's good. Now, why don't you turn to the person on the other side and say, I'm sorry I didn't choose you. Um, it's nothing personal. I believe you're made in the image of God. I love you. As a brother or sister in Christ, I'm sorry. I meant nothing by that. It was instinct. I just turned away. It didn't mean a thing. Go ahead and grab your Bible. Do you guys know we're in the middle of a very exciting weekend for um, our church with our youth? Yeah. Best weekend ever. Yeah. Best weekend ever is going on right now. I was in this room yesterday morning with uh, several hundred of our teenagers, and they were praying up a storm. It was absolutely incredible. And then we did a couple of workshops. We were hanging out, and they were asking me Bible and theology questions. And I got to tell you, there is a lot of incredible teenagers in the church. They're really mature in their faith. And in some of the ways, they're already leading our church, um, certainly in engagement and worship. I think it's a brilliant thing and a beautiful thing. I love that about this generation. I do wish that they would make more facial expressions, though. <laughs> right? Like, if I do have a criticism with this generation, it's I just, that is a part I don't get. You talk to them for like five minutes, and there should be above zero facial expressions in a five minute conversation. And they won't explain to me why that is, right? So, you know, okay, they're doing their best. If you do have a Bible, grab it, open it to Matthew chapter five. Do you have a Bible? If not, that's okay. We should probably put Bibles in those like pockets behind the seats, right? Those like suspiciously large pockets. <laughs> what did they think you guys were gonna put in there when they designed that? Bringing a lot of groceries to church? <laughs> Have need for, you know, 11 pounds of stuff? Honestly, though, if you do sit in the same seat every week, you could probably save some money on storage by keeping some of your stuff in there. I'm fine with it, honestly. It's not that big of a deal. Just write your name on it. Um, we should put Bibles in there, though, shouldn't we? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I'm sure that tepid applause really blessed the Lord God. <laughs> He's up in heaven just weeping. <laughs> Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 5. He says, you... Point to yourself. Say, me. Yeah, he says, you, you are something. You are something. I want to talk to you about your identity in Christ this morning. I want to talk to you about who Jesus believes that you are and how he is right and how your feelings are wrong unless they align with what he says. And I want to talk to you about who you are in Christ and what you can do through Christ. And I'm really hoping it really just blesses your heart today. Jesus says, you, you are the salt of the earth. Jesus is like, you are salty. You are this earth's salt. Then he says, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? Which is funny. I wish they would have translated it literally because it literally says, how can salt be resalted? How can, you, how can you salt salt? Like if you have salt and it's not salty, you're like, ugh, like what am I gonna do with this salt? Am I gonna salt my salt to make the salt salty? Because the unsalty salt isn't salty, right? That's what Jesus is saying. I love it. It's such a unique way of looking at something. He's like, if the salt isn't salty, then it's, it's not good for anything, right? It's useless, right? You're not gonna put salt on salt to make it salty, which is intriguing, right? And, you know, it's, it's not even really possible because salt is a mineral and salt doesn't become not salty. There's all these Christians all over the world trying to say that it can happen, but it can't. And then all of these other people are on the internet being like, see, see, Bible's not real because like Jesus said that salt could not be salty, checkmate, right? And then all these terrified Christians are like, Jesus wasn't a chemist. That doesn't count. He's just saying something. So stop bringing your atheist beliefs here. Take them back to Reddit, 
okay? <laughs> and then the real truth is that the fact that salt can't be made unsalty is the point. Jesus is using this thing. It's called hyperbole. He's making a point. Jesus said a camel could fit through the eye of a needle, and that would be easier than a rich person getting into heaven. He's not saying that can literally happen because that literally can't happen, right? He's making a point. What's the point? Well, let's see where he goes with it. He says, if the salt isn't salty, you're not gonna put more salt on it. You can't. It's not good for anything. It's a good for a nothing, except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Jesus sometimes told stories a couple times. When he told this in Luke, at a different time, he said, salt that's not salty isn't worth anything. It's not even worth being thrown on the pile of manure, which is very funny. And he's saying here, like, it's, it's, not, it's not anything. It's not, it's not worth anything. Jesus is saying, you are salt. Now, we think of salt as like, I'm gonna put some salt on fries or whatever. Or these fries are too salty. That's not what it was for them. Salt was the preserver. They would use salt to preserve meat. That was like the main thing they did. Because if you can't put meat in the refrigerator or the freezer, it's gonna get gross really fast, right? And so instead, you'd put the salt on it, it would preserve the meat, and then you can eat it. And salt was so valuable that some... Um, uh, soldiers in ancient countries were paid in salt. The word salt and salary are actually connected uh, because of that thing. So salt was incredibly valued because it was a preserver. God is saying, you are the preservers of the world. God is saying, if you follow Jesus Christ, you are the ones who preserve the world. The world is rapidly decaying like a hamburger that you forgot outside after your barbecue, and you, Christians, are the ones who preserve the world. You are brilliant and beautiful for the world. You are bringing about a function that God wants in this world. You are preserving it. What would happen if you thought about yourself like that? What would happen in your life if you believed that about yourself? What would happen in your home if you believed, not that you had to be that, but that God already made you that, right? Certainly not nothing. What if you were like, I'm like this guy, right? What if you were like, <laughs> I am God's cosmic salt bay, right? If you don't know who this guy is, I think that's probably a good thing. And I'm happy you're a better person than me, right? God's like, you are the preserver of the earth. You are the cosmic galactic salt bay, right? And what is salt if it's not salty? It's just like sand, right? Which, of course, makes me think of Anakin Skywalker. We got any people that love some good prequel memes in here? Anybody? Yeah? Man, I'm so tired of people gatekeeping men's hobbies. I'm 36. I love Jesus. And I also happen to like bad sci-fi movies. There's nothing wrong with that. Men, you enjoy what you enjoy. Have your hobby, right? I spend an hour every day looking at Star Wars memes, and that's a good thing. Well, that's not really a good thing. It's a bad thing. But what does he say? He says, sand, it's coarse, it's rough, it's irritating. It gets everywhere. Salt without saltiness is basically sand. If Jesus was giving this sermon now, he probably wouldn't say you're, you're the salt of the earth. He probably would say something like this. You're the refrigerator of the earth, right? Because, because salt was used to preserve, and that's what a refrigerator is. It's for preserving things and making them last longer than they could last if they were out on their own. God is saying you, as a Christian, don't have to be salt. You are that. That is what you are. When the Holy Spirit entered your life, when you chose to follow Christ, you became a preserver of the world. There's something brilliant when we choose to think about ourselves the way that God communicates that we are. I love this church father quote about this passage. He said, they seasoned with divine wisdom the hearts of the human race, which had been made tasteless by the devil. What a beautiful quote. And then Jesus goes on to tell us something else about ourselves. He says, you're the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden. I think we understand this in general, what he's saying. He's saying if there was a city that was on top of a mountain, it would be impossible to not be able to see it, right? 
Like I live over by the Superstition Mountains. If someone put a big city up there with all the lights and everything, it, we would see it all the time, right? When we're driving around, when we're on the highway, you can't hide it, right? And then we would be like, why did they get to have that land? Why can't I build up there, right? That's amazing. I'd love to live up there. Jesus is saying, you are like that. Jesus isn't saying, don't hide. He's saying, you can't be hidden. Jesus isn't saying, don't hide the light. He's saying, it can't be hidden. The light that God has put within you cannot be hidden what would happen in your life if you believed the things that Jesus says about you and didn't look into your feelings to decide who you are? What would happen in your life if you believed the things that Jesus says? Jesus says to you, you are a light. We are not the light. We are a light. We collectively are the light. I can't be hidden and I just start to like think about stuff like this, and then I think, man, like what would happen if everybody believed everything that God says about them? Like what would happen in a church if everyone believed everything God said about them? Or what would happen in your home if you believed all of the things that God says, not the worst things that have been said to you, not the insecurities that you have? What if you just jettisoned those things and chose to believe, I am who God says I am, Right? The world says you are who you think you are, right? And Jesus says, no, you are who I say you are. What would happen if you believed that, right? And there's all these, all these things in the Bible about that. Like I, I went through the first half of the book of Ephesians and there's like a ton of stuff that the Bible is communicating about you and about who you are. Like not who you are on your own, who you are in Christ. This phrase comes up so many times in the book of Ephesians. It says, in him, you are faithful. What would happen in your life if you believed that about yourself? In him, you are blessed by the Father. What would happen in your brain and in your marriage if you believed truly that in Christ you are blessed by God? I am blessed. I am chosen, right? What a beautiful, brilliant thing. God looked across the galactic line of people and chose me. I don't know why. I think he could have picked someone better, but he has chosen me. I am chosen by God. What would happen in your life if you believed that? We are redeemed, that the mysterious nature of God's will is revealed to us in Christ, that in Christ there is the full uniting of all things. What would happen if you believed that, that I am a part of God's uniting of all things, that in Christ there is an inheritance. I am a prince or princess in this world, God has given me the keys to the kingdom. God has given me his inheritance uh, that I have received the salvation and sealing of the Holy Spirit. What would happen if you, if you believed that, if you told yourself, this is who I am in Christ? What would happen if you believed this? that in Christ, God has given to you, to every single person who's chosen to follow him, the gift of the spirit of wisdom. I might not have much. I might not be who I thought I would become. I might not be who I wish I was. I might not even be who other people think I am. But look, look at what I have. I have the gift of the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. What would happen if you believed that, right? I think a lot of amazing things, and there's way more stuff than that, that God is working his immeasurable power in you, that we are raised from the dead and seated with Christ, that we are shown immeasurable riches and kindness. What a beautiful thing to believe about yourself. The world tells you to count up your traumas and pains. God certainly doesn't say to ignore them, but he does say to lift up your eyes, Christian. Lift up your eyes to the hills and see the truth of what God has done for you, of who God has made you to be, that God has shown you immeasurable riches and kindness, that if all God ever did was save you, that that would have been more than enough to provide a lifetime of joy. And has he not given you so much more than that? What would happen if you chose to identify yourself in that way? 
that I was created for good works, that I've been brought near by his blood, that the dividing wall of hostility between me and God has been broken down in the flesh of God, that the creation of peace has happened by defeating the two versions of me. This is my favorite one, that we're being built into a home for the Holy Spirit, that God would say to you today that the way that you should view yourself, if you're a follower of Christ, is that this is the apartment for the Holy Spirit and that God is sending his angelic construction crew into your life to build you into the perfect home for the Holy Spirit. And, and I just have to stop stopping him from continuing on with construction, right? And, and if my heart was an apartment, I probably wouldn't want to live there sometimes. But that's okay, because God is making me into something that I cannot make myself into. God, Christian, is making you into the home that the Holy Spirit wants to live in, right? And you never drive up to a house that's in construction and say, this place is awful, it's, 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 it's on its way. It's being built into something, right? It's not there yet, but we're not going to complain about it because it's under construction. This is what is happening to you. Man, I just, I want that for you. I want you to see yourself the way God sees you. Oh, and there's more, that we've seen all of these truths that God has made up for us and that God has given to us. And then in the text, we get these two significant ones, that we are salt and we are light. So he continues on with this idea here, and he says, nor do people light a lamp. And this is just a bit confusing in English because in, in Greek, he actually uses three different words for light. He uses this word phos, which just means like light, and then he uses this word, which means burn, like to, like, you know, like to burn, like to burn a candle. And that actually is a better word, I, I think, to translate this. He really is talking about a candle, right? He's saying, nor do people burn a candle and put it under a basket. Why don't people do that? Because they're not pyromaniacs, right? Because they're like, you know what's going to happen is this candle's going to burn this basket, right? That's why we don't do that, right? We're not going to do that because we're not nuts, right? Because that makes no sense, right? But what do they do? They put the candle, the candle that's burning on a stand, and it gives light. This is actually a third different word for light in Greek. This word means to shine. You could literally translate it, give light, because it's not talking about what the light is. It's talking about what the light gives the light is a light. The light gives brightness. It's shining, right? You could literally translate it like they did. It gives light. I love that. That's a really beautiful truth. It gives light to the whole house. Jesus says, in the same way, let your light shine. There he uses both of them. It says the word light twice in Greek with two different words. First is the general word for light. Then is the one we were just talking about. He, you could literally translate this, let your light give light. What a beautiful picture for a Christian today. Let your light that God has put in you give light to others. Let the light, Christian, that God has given to you give light to the world, to brighten the world, to shine in the world. God did not make you to be hidden. God made you to shine and give the brightness of Christ to the world. Why? So that people love you and follow you on Instagram? No, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You know what the word glory means? We've talked about this before. The word glory means what you are shining your light on. When it says we're gonna glorify and praise God, it means we're gonna shine the light of our heart on something. So it's really beautiful what Jesus is saying. He's saying, hey, you are a light, so let your light give light to others so that they give their light to the Father. What a beautiful thing. As the whole world seeks to endlessly shine spotlights on themselves, 
as the whole world views everything as a stage, everything as a performance, and everything about how many lights and eyes are on me. What a, what a brilliant upside down way of living to let your light give light to your world so that they would give their light to the Father. I love that. That's really, that's really something beautiful. So what Jesus is saying is not be a light. He's not saying that. He's saying that you already are one. That's a different thing. If you believe that what Jesus is saying is you have to be a light, then you're going to have to apply effort to become one. But you don't. You apply your effort elsewhere because you already are a light. So don't hide. He's saying you can't. He's saying you, you, you literally can't hide. And then just to sum up what he's saying there, he's saying, let your light give light. Give brightness to the house, give light to the world, and give glory to your Father. And I think the thing that is hard sometimes is sometimes I just don't feel, you know, very bright, right? Like I've sinned, I've slipped up, I've screwed up, I've tripped up, I've failed, and so I don't feel like, you know, I am a light in the world or whatever. I think is something perhaps that a lot of us can relate to um, I bought this flashlight on Amazon. It's one of those, like, it's one of those, like, I have a, a million lumens type of flashlights that you order, and then you're like, what is the thing that someone needs to see this brightly, right? <laughs> I'm not even going to shine it on your face, because if I did, your pupils would become pinholes, and you get a headache when you walk outside. But it's just like wildly, unnecessarily bright. And um, often I don't feel like I am or have enough brightness. And so when Jesus says, um, you are the light of the world, and I look inside, I'm like, man, I really just don't. I really don't feel like that. And I think maybe some of us can relate to that. Maybe. It's a really beautiful thing because Jesus isn't saying you have to be the 100,000 million lumens flashlight. He's actually talking about a candle. He isn't saying you have to be this. He's saying you already are this, right? Pressure's off. This is... Um, that incredible candle from anthropology. Have you guys smelled this one? Oh my gosh, I love this candle. It's so amazing, and I'm not ashamed to say it. <laughs> I love, this is what it smells like in heaven, <laughs> right? When you get to heaven, you're gonna use all five of your senses. You're gonna be like, whoa, it smells like the volcano candle from anthro, Oh, whoa, heaven, it tastes like a Chick-fil-A sandwich. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Heaven, it sounds like that sound when I first turned on my Game Boy in 1999. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Sounds like the Pokemon theme song in 8 bits coming out of that small speaker. Wow. Right? Jesus isn't saying you have to be a light. He isn't saying, you know, you have to become this. He's saying you already are this. And um, I was reading about candles um, this week uh, in preparation for um, this talk for you guys today. And um, one of the things I read was um, about the, the amount of light that candles bring and these scientists are saying that um, if the world was flat, um, which it isn't, <laughs> which it's nuts that you have to say that now. <laughs> it's absolutely insane that you have to say that now, right? I, I just don't, I, don't even, I shouldn't even dive into that. That'd be a mistake. <laughs> but sometimes... It's like two in the morning and I'm watching TikToks of a guy defending flat earth theory and I'm just looking at the sky and I'm like, man, like you get to vote the same amount of times that I do. <laughs> like that's crazy, right? It's crazy. You are made in the image of God. Like what is wrong with you? Like 
The scientists say that if the earth was flat, which it is not, that with the naked eye, you could see a single candle flame 30 miles away. That a candle flame brings about so much brightness in itself that just with your eye, from 30 miles straight away, you could see the faint glow of a candle. I also read this amazing story about this um, scientist. His name was uh, Dr. Zhu. And Dr. Zhu said um, something that I, I, I couldn't really understand, which was, I guess, like the, some of the particles that are in a candle flame, they know what they are, and some of the other ones they don't, or something like that, or they didn't up to a certain point. And, and let me just read what he said. Um, uh, Dr. Zhu's investigation um, revealed... Oh, wait, no, that's the wrong sentence. Dr. Zhu said, a colleague at another university said to me, of course no one knows what a candle flame is actually made of. And Dr. Zhu said, I told him I believed science could explain everything eventually, so I decided to find out. And then using a sampling technique that he invented himself, he was able to remove particles from the center of the flame, something that was never successfully achieved before, and found to his surprise that a candle flame contains all four known forms of carbon. Now, I don't know what that means, right? I don't know. I have no idea what he's talking about, right? The bottom of the flame... It's, it was already known that hydrocarbon molecules existed, which were converted into carbon dioxide by the top of the flame, but the process in between became a mystery. Dr. Zhu said this was a surprise because each form is usually created under different conditions. And I'm just like, yeah, like I have no, absolutely no idea what you're talking about, right? And then check this out. Quote, Dr. Zhu's investigation revealed that the, there were 1.5 million diamond nanoparticles created every second in a candle flame as it burns. So he discovered that the thing that people couldn't figure out what it was was some type of diamond nanoparticle, and that was what gave it this unbelievable brightness for how small it really is. And since Jesus knows everything, I think thoughts like, I wonder if that scientific fact is the reason why Jesus chose a candle when he was first telling this story. So that people would see that you don't have to be this like perfect, amazing, monumental flashlight brightness, that you can just be who God made you to be, and that that is absolutely enough. So I guess the point of the sermon is to stay salty and to stay bright. I was going to write stay lit, but I just thought, (laughs) I'm too old for this. I can't do that. And then I was going to write from the city on a hill, I was going to write stay high. But then I thought, I can't can't make a pot joke two weekends in a row. <laughs> can't do that. So I did, I did this. Stay salty and stay bright. Recognize who you are in Christ and who Christ has made you to be. I wrote this down as, a, as an additional summary. Recognize who God made you to be. Be who God made you to be and preserve and brighten the world. What a beautiful idea. And you know, it's also interesting because the world does not want these two functions. The world does not want to be preserved. The world wants to decay. The world wants to live in sin and decay. That's what it wants. God has made you something that the world needs but doesn't want. He has made you to preserve it. And the world does not want light shined on them. It says that that like a, a hundred times in the New Testament, that people in the world love darkness, but the people of Jesus move into and stay into the light. 
If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, it says. There's a million verses about that, that Jesus is the light of the world and that the people love darkness. And so keep in mind that God has made you a light in a world that does not want to be lit up. It does not want that thing. I wrote down, God has made you into what the world needs, not what the world wants. And having that attitude as a Christian really helps when you rub up against the world because you were not made to be a part of this world. You were made to be a part of the next world. The Bible says that you have died and your life is hidden with Christ who is on high. And when he appears, we also will appear with him in glory. This is this beautiful idea that we have been made into something that we should believe about ourselves. That thing does not match up with the world and the world will not like it. But that doesn't change the fact that that's who we've been made to be. You've been made uh, son or daughter of God into a preserver of the world and into a light to give light. So give your light to your world so that your people give their light to God. What a beautiful thing. What a beautiful truth. Yeah. Amen. Let's pray together. I'm going to stand here and smell this candle. It smells so good. Yes, Lord God, we thank you and praise you in this place for who you are and for what you're doing. We pray that you would shine the light of Jesus Christ in Gilbert, Arizona, and in Mesa, Arizona, and in Queen Creek, and in Chandler, and Tempe, and Santan, and all the other cities that are around here, because we want to see people come to know the good news of Jesus. We can't deliver it. We can't manufacture it, but we can't be who we aren't. We cannot be who we are not. We have been made to preserve the world, and we have been made to give light to the world. And so we commit now to do that, and we commit to take joy in it, and we commit to not take it personally when people don't like that, because it isn't us that they don't like. It's Christ and what Christ is doing in the world, and so we rejoice in that. We're praying that you would reveal yourself to people in our lives. We're praying that when we shine the light of Christ in our homes, on our streets, and in our offices, and in our Um, cars and in our buses and wherever we find ourselves this week, we pray, God, that you would open the eyes of people to see the light of Christ through us so that they would give glory to you, God. We pray that when people see the light that we have, they wouldn't give glory to us. We don't want it. We don't want your glory. We certainly won't accept it. And we'll be very careful to make sure that it all goes to you because that's where it belongs. And so we're praying and asking that the people in our lives that we want to come see, uh, we want to see come to know you would see the light that we give um, and would give the glory, the light of their heart to the Father. And so we pray this now in the name of Jesus. Amen.